last session, we discussed, um, did we change the number up here? Okay. <clears throat> we uh, took out from dealing with direct psalms, and we started dealing with subjects that pertain to the things that we had been talking about. And I want to continue to do that, but I want to, I want to go to a different area this time. I want to go to the area of waiting on the Lord. And um, one of the things that you see constantly in the Psalms is wait on the Lord. That is like all throughout, and that's why I'm addressing it, because I want to address, last class we addressed things that were common in the Psalms. This is another one of those, and yet this also follows suit on what we shared last class and really the last two or three, four classes. Um, waiting on the Lord. And so uh, let's go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. I'm going to read just a little bit different translation here, maybe the one you're using. Uh, starting with verse 1, we'll go through verse 9. Do not fret because of evildoers. Well, read that right there. Old. <laughs> do not fret because of evildoers. Well, what do we normally do? We fret. Okay, but anyway. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. <laughs> uh, verse 1. I'm reading from a little bit different translation. Yeah. This is the uh, RTN. <laughs> Not, no. <clears throat> the really terrible nuss bomb. I mean, no. Uh, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord. Okay, I mean, you got to get that first of all. Don't fret. Don't be envious, for they, they <clears throat> excuse me, will wither like the grass. That little concept there of withering like the grass is very common in the Bible. All right? The response is, <clears throat> don't withhold water from them so they wither <clears throat> quicker. The response, response is, trust in the Lord and do good. What? Do good to wrongdoers? Do good to evildoers? Dwell in the land. Well, in the land, stay in the promised land. Don't get outside the promised land. And cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart, which obviously doesn't necessarily mean everything you ever wanted. But as Carolyn Allen has shared many times, when you're really going after the Lord, your heart has His desires in it, and so you're actually delighting in His. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord means evildoers and wrongdoers are giving you a hard time. Commit your way to the Lord. You see, it sounds spiritual if you just read it without that in mind. Commit your way to the Lord. Oh, I'm doing that. And then the first time wrongdoers, evildoers start messing with you, um, you start fretting instead of committing your way to the Lord. Uh, trust also in Him and He will do it. He will do what? He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. And here's the big line. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger. Can I get amen? Amen. Can I get an amen from the men section? Amen. Could you say that a little lower? <laughs> um, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. Doesn't it? Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off. And, and just, just to ask you, how do we know evildoers will be cut off? Because of the circumcision. Amen. 
flesh will be cut away. Uh, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. All right, so the main verse there is rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The word doesn't say rest in indifference or passivity. And that's what most people think waiting on the Lord is. They think it's sort of an inactive thing when it's a very active thing. Okay? And I can see how people would get confused. Well, I don't want to wait on the Lord. Something's got to be done. And there, therein is the problem. Something is being done if you're truly waiting. <clears throat> um, so it doesn't say rest in indifference. or that, uh, And also doesn't say wait for events. Right? And that's where we, because um, we have um, this mentality that an event must happen. Well, an event does need to happen. We need to conform to the image of Christ. There's a greater thing. Now, this only applies to those who really want to conform to the image of Christ, okay? So all you people who don't want <laughs> <laughs> As Nisi said, you're free. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, my subtitle here is The Time Factor and Fretfulness. Why do we fret? Because we have certain convictions, or, or can I say it another way, expectations. We have certain expectations. Ideas of what ought to be or the way things ought to go expectations or conviction these are convictions let's use the word of convictions because that takes it out of the realm of the flesh expectations well we all know we shouldn't be going by expectation so let's say we have certain convictions now we're spiritual it's still expectations and we're still looking for events to take place instead of looking to the Lord um, <clears throat> We fret and we worry concerning these things. In the final analysis, <clears throat> the realization of the things that we, the convictions or the expectations we have may not be in God's agenda at all. How disappointing for us. <laughs> How disappointing because that's, because surely God's thinking what we're thinking. <clears throat> Well, let's see, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not, you know, I mean, that's, you know, somewhere when we accept that scripture, just in general, then every thought that comes to our mind will go, you know, uh, we'll either say, is this the Lord or is this me? And we'll weigh it in light of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, there's this other side, and that is we fret, but God never frets. I mean, think about it. I mean, when they were doing the worst to Jesus, he's not sitting up there going, my God, I better just, I better strike them all dead now. Well, if he had have, then everybody would have gone to hell. You know what I'm saying? He's committed to the cross because he's committed to the resurrection. There can be no resurrection without death. No need talking about resurrection until you're dead. A lot of people talking about, I've heard people say, and they, you know, they, 40 years of this, you know, somebody says, all you ever talk about is death. You know, well, what about life? What about the resurrection? Well, are you dead yet? I mean, if you're dead, then we can talk about resurrection, but there, there ain't no need to talk because there ain't going to be no resurrection until there's a death. You know, when you get that right, we'll move on. <clears throat> all right, so... And then, of course, we get in a hurry, but God's never in a hurry, so he's not pushing stuff. Why are we in such a hurry to see them punished? Because we do not believe, and in reality, we don't believe in the Lord. That's the problem. We really don't believe in the Lord. We don't believe that he, he's, in his timing, in his way, things will work out. Uh, you could almost say it like this when you include what I shared in the last class. Let evil run its course and build its pit. Okay. 
in the book of Daniel, and I won't reteach the class that I taught a long time ago, but the book of Daniel is about governments. And it gets right down into personal governments too, folks. You're either a, you know, a lion or this or that or whatever, you know, all the heads that, same body. It's all out of the same beast, but it has different heads. <clears throat> and uh, one of the goals of the Lord there was to let each of those kingdoms rise, show itself with its benefits, and prove if its government is good enough. And they always ended up selfishly and wrong and bad for most of the people, okay? But God didn't seem to be in a hurry. He seemed to let them build their own pit. He, he seemed to let them r let those kingdoms run their course, let evil run its course. Why? Because at some juncture, and who knows, I mean, we don't know, but at some juncture, that evil will run its course. It will have dug its pit and it will be caught by its own net. You have to believe that. And God doesn't have to do anything. It's going to happen. But you got to let them build their own pit. I mean, um, I've often thought, and I usually don't say too much on this kind of stuff, but I did last class, so I will this one. Um, you know, I know people who have gotten away with murder with me or, or places like this because the lamb didn't answer back. And, uh, and the Lord told me, he said, you know, because they got away with murder, in their heart it was murder. You lay down your life. But in their heart it was murder. When they leave this place, they're going to murder someone else. And then they're going to go to someone else and someone else and someone else. And I felt like the Lord told me, well, one did actually, but that, that they're going to eventually end up in prison. Someone will because they're getting away with murder. Do you understand? And the more you get away with it, the more you think that you'll never get caught. Yeah, you can do it. Okay, well, we say, we say well, we've got to put the hammer down and stop this because, you understand, we say, you know, let evil run its course. Let it build its pit. And let me tell you, God will take care of it. The, only, the, main, you know, the main thing I do is I pray for other people. I mean, I pray for people that's going to cross the path of some of these people. And you know what? It's not, pe it's not just people who've been here and left. Folks, the world is full of these kind of people. It's full of monsters. My God, they're everywhere. I didn't create them. This isn't a monster creation pit here. <laughs> this is, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the world is full of them. And, and you know what? The Internet's full of them, too. Okay? <laughs> So just, just to make you aware of that, uh, but I believe the things that the Lord showed me there in Daniel, and I believe that God's way is to let that, so that when they stand before him, they won't have a word to say. I gave you free reign for this period of time. This is what you did with it, and this is how it ended up. You reject, because the end deal is you rejected me. That's what the Lord will say. You rejected me. It's not about him or them or this or that or outside of this church, that, you know, as far as you want to go. It's about that you rejected me. And that's the, that'll be the final issue of all eternity. <clears throat> all right. So let's go to Isaiah 40 and verse 27. And I'm going to read another version of this one too. <clears throat> Isaiah 40 and verse 27. And since you might have a different translation, you may just want to listen while I, I read it. Isaiah 40, we're going to read 27 through 31. <clears throat> I love this. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God? All right. Do you think that that's true? <laughs> Well, absolutely we don't think that's true until you get in a situation and they get away with it for a while. And then you think that it's true. But it's not true. Why can't we put on our um, religious cap at that moment? Because religiously we know that it's, this is true. Religion is totally powerless. Religion has no power. The theology of Christ and Him crucified has no power. Only Christ and Him crucified has power. All right. 
So, and the reason why I challenge you on these things is because we do, not just us here, Christians in general have a religious mentality and a real life mentality. And they hold to the religious mentality until they get in a crisis, and then they go with the, the real-life mentality that they have, which is really contrary in most cases to what they claim they believe. Okay? But if you believe it, it has you. You don't have it. And that's the way I look at true belief. True belief has you. You don't have it. I live by the faith of the Son of God. All right. So, my, uh, why do you say this, Jacob? Why do you assert this, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives, okay. Now, interestingly enough, he's addressing the people who are saying, I'm getting away with murder and God doesn't even notice. Okay, that's who he's addressing or, or who is addressing him. And when he addresses them back, he doesn't actually talk to them. He talks to the ones that they're getting away with murder with. <laughs> but first, he tells, he describes himself. Before he describes them, he describes himself. Why would he do that? Because we're one with him. Because he's the source, the fountain of living waters. Because he's everything to us. Because he is our source in everything from strength to patience to everything else. Amen? Amen. <laughs> or at least he's supposed to be that. All right. So if he's talking about himself, guess what? He's going to talk about you in the same way if you are, as Mallory said in the last class, you are his flesh and his bones. Am I right? He, you, you will be drawn in and expected to be the way he is. Okay? That's not meanness. That's not putting something on you that you can't do. If union is there, if connection by life, not theology is there, it's possible for you. Now, it doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean you won't stumble. I mean, it doesn't mean that you won't fail. God will use those failures. But you have to still believe. I'm one. You cannot leave oneness. You cannot leave, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad you are, you cannot leave oneness. Okay? Why? Because Jesus died for it. Forget you, forget your need. He died to make you one. He wants you to be one. That's his heart. That's what he lives for. That's what he thinks about. He never, that thought never leaves him. He never wanders concerning it. <laughs> we do. But he never does. So, when they said this thing about my way is hidden from the Lord and the justice due me escapes the notice of God, his, res his response is, do you not know? And our thought is, oh boy, he's going to lay it on them. But he says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Oh boy. And then he speaks of himself, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become wearied or tired. His understanding is in inscrutable. He, he is rejected and despised of men, but he keeps going. Amen? And then he, then he changes it to us because we're his body. He gives strength to the weary, not to the one who says, God doesn't notice, I'm getting away with, you know, I'm getting away. He speaks to the weary. Folks, if you're not the weary, if you're the strong, then you're offensive probably. <laughs> Very offensive. <laughs> okay? But if you are one with him, you don't have to be defensive. You just have to be one with him. Really, 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 and really, really. You don't have to be, you don't have to go the opposite extreme. You know, we say, well, that's a balance. No, it's not. That's a false balance. You know, the Bible talks about that. False balance is an abomination to God. Well, the balance of being offensive is defensive. 
but that's a false balance. The only true balance is Christ, and if, we don't, if we're not balanced in Christ by Christ, we're out of balance. I don't care how good you are, okay? The Lord is the balance of everything. All right, so he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. And then he, then he describes, though, though youth, even though youths, they grow weary and tired. And vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet those who wait for the Lord will change strength. They will mount up. Okay, more than the youth, more than the uh, vigorous young men, I qualify. I'm weary. <laughs> I qualify. <clears throat> I'm going to get the mount up with wings as eagles. I am going to get to. And I'll be able to do better than the vigorous young men or whatever because it is union with the Lord that brings it about. It don't matter if you're 63, 62. What is it? 62, sorry, didn't mean to make you older than what you are. <clears throat> they will mount up with wings like eagles. Well, you know, folks, the wings like eagles is better than the wings of sparrows. Right? Why? Because they can catch the, what are they called? The, the currents, the wind currents, the drafts. They can, they can just float effortlessly along and fly and just if you've ever watched them just a few flaps and there they go again you know they start slowing down a few flaps and, and they're up again okay whereas the sparrows going dude can I land soon you know okay you will mount up with wings as eagles meaning it's it's like any of any of you ever surfed there is nothing like laying on a board going out, hitting, going against the grain of the waves, hitting you, having to bring your board up when the wave comes so that you can go over it as you're going out and everything, and then you turn around, and then you lay on that board, and you look behind you, and you wait, and you're waiting for just the right wave, and just the right one starts swelling, and you watch the swell because you know which ones will carry you, and just the right one comes along, and then here you go again, using your strength, and you start paddling and everything because you're trying to catch the, the, the same movement and timing as that wave, and then you angle yourself into it, and you get on your board, and it takes you all the way to shore, and it's just sweet. The only bad part of getting, you gotta paddle back out. But nonetheless, it really is fun though. It's, it's one of the few fun things that I used to do when I was young. <clears throat> and so, the idea behind this is that there really is something that will carry you. Okay, now, could, could Christianity admit that? You know, can it admit that, that there's something that will carry you? I think that most Christians believe that, but we give up on the Lord like within the first two years. Then we go to the Holy Spirit, then we go to gifts, then we go to this, then we go to that, then we keep moving, and then we tire, uh, tire and get discouraged, and then we, you know, backslide, and then we, I don't know, I don't know, the, may I never know the <laughs> progression of what that is, but. That's the case. <clears throat> um, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. <clears throat> God has said and still says to his son. God said to, to his son a long time ago, and he still says it to his son, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies the, the footstool of thy feet. Meaning, and here's why I say it that way, meaning Jesus didn't immediately have to rise from the dead and um, see everybody who ever mistreated him immediately turn to dust. <laughs> yeah. 
He didn't have a need for that. He didn't feel like, man, I got to, you know, when I rise from the dead, I'm going to show him. The resurrection had a little more behind it than revenge. <laughs> and a lot of times, even our mentality of resurrection is a revenge thing. When it is a glorious thing to the Father, that, and, and I'll tell you what's glorious is, we brought the Father many sons in the image of Christ. Jesus has brought back a bride, on and on and on. Just incredible reality, but we're going, well, I'm ready to see the enemy fall, you know. Um, so God would have said to Jesus, sit, do nothing, wait for me. Wait till thine enemies. <clears throat> But it is not the calendar which is keeping God from acting. God does not work based on the elements of days and times and seasons. God works based on conditions and states. Your condition and your state and where you're at. He may be waiting until we stop fretting, until our care is cast upon him and we come to rest in the Lord. And of course, that's why uh, Psalm uh, 37 brings that out so much but our impatience is not merely negative where God is concerned it is a positive hindrance um, and I've got I wrote down a couple of examples but I think I want to touch on something else here I want to I want us to see lesser things but but still important because sometimes we cannot grab the cross. We can't grab the high calling. And so the Lord gives us lesser things to hold on to, hopefully until. Okay? Hopefully until. Because he's, he's a good God. He's gracious. He's, you know. Uh, the trials and testings are the Lord's means of confirming himself to us. Exodus 17 gives us a picture of this. Moses has, had just led the children of Israel across the Red Sea, and now they're wanting some water to drink. In verse 2, they come to Moses and say, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? <clears throat> when we begin to walk with the Lord, and he brings us to a no-water experience, we're prone to think that we have missed his will. At this point, at this point, had the people missed God's will or were, or were they where he wanted them to be? And that's the, that's the question. Were they where he wanted them to be? And the answer is they were exactly in the will of God. We think that every mess up is a failure on our part and that we're not in the middle of the will of God. Okay? Well, if we can't see the cross, we can't grab all that, we can't move with the Lord, I got news for you. Not every mess up means you're out of whack with God. If I'll, I'll get as low as I can to help you, but I'll always point you back to the cross. <clears throat> um, I think, uh, let's see, God wanted to confirm himself to them, but it was a stretching time. He wants to confirm, uh, I wrote down the verse, Philippians 4.19, that my God shall supply your need according to his riches, according to his resources, according to him. Um, and something like that verse, and there are many other verses, but something like that verse is simply just a verse until it's confirmed in us. It's just a verse. Well, uh, I, this thought came to me the other morning when I woke up. I was just laying there. And I saw a, you know, a master teacher like Gamaliel, if you're familiar with him in the book of Acts, a, a, a rabbi of rabbis, and all these students before him. And, and he said to this one student, quote for me, quote for me as much of the scriptures as you can or whatever, some portion, as much as Jeremiah or something like that. And this young student stood up and he began to quote and 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 he just kept going. All the other students are looking at him. And he's, just, he's just, 
it was just going and going and going, chapter after chapter, and you know, they're getting halfway through the book, and then they're getting further, and finally it comes to the end of the book. And the, the teacher, the master teacher says, you have done a fine job. And the student just, just sticks out here. He's just got this pride of knowing the scriptures. And then the master says, now, when you learn humility, and that's all I remember, and w what I saw from that is, there, if you learn the scriptures, you can do that with a good memory. Did you know that? You don't actually have to have any true change of character. God gives, you know, I mean, like Abigail's got a terrific memory, you know. Uh, and somebody said to me, well, I think I heard him, I think, I, somebody said to Nisi, Abigail is really smart. And Nisi said, she's got a really good memory. They didn't catch what she was saying, but I, I did. I heard what she said. And basically she's saying, you know, she remembers everything. So, you know, you would assume that she's smart because she can bring all this stuff up, you know. But, you know, and somebody with a bad memory can't bring all that up, but, but we're using this as an example of someone who has a good memory and can learn many things, but they get prideful in it. As opposed to learning humility, which you don't learn with a memory. And you know what I mean when I say humility. I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. And, I don't want to be super spiritual and say, well, that's Christ and da da da. I don't want to go off on that. I'm saying actual humility being formed in you, that's a real work. <laughs> My God, that's a work. You think it was hard to learn the whole book of Jeremiah and quote it. Where do you learn humility and what it's going to take to go through to learn it? Amen? I mean, God's not interested in making us more religious. The things that impress so many people in religious are absolutely nothing to the Lord. They don't impress him at all. He doesn't look down many of the services and, and just go, oh, this just pleases me so much. A lot of it could be flesh. And if it's flesh, he's just like, I hate this. And more importantly, if it's not Christ, this is not what I sent my son to die for and rise again over um, so, the Lord wants to work, he wants to deal with us by scriptures and teaching, but then he wants to confirm it in us. And to do that is going to be way harder than to sit in the class and listen. It's going to be tougher, okay? But God's faithful. You know, I mean, for me, memorizing the book of Jeremiah would be incredibly hard, but not near as hard as going through stuff until you become truly broken. And <laughs> that's hard, okay? <clears throat> Just before this water incident, the people of Israel had had the experience of the bitter water at Mara. But they had, just before this one in Exodus uh, 17, they'd had this other one with the water, okay? And, uh, uh, but God is not just taking us back to another Mara each time. And this is where we will miss it. We'll go, I've been here before. And I actually alluded to this the last class. Um, he's not just taking us back to another Mara. In verses three and four of chapter 17, it says, but the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did... You bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. God has no delight in just taking us through testings. And that's the important thing. We think he does. We think God gets a kick out of just running us back and forth around the wilderness, round and round. And he just likes that. And there's something, you know, he doesn't like that. He wants us to learn something with each time. Water this time, water this time. Apply something. Or at least get it confirmed. 
that you understand what the deal is. Do you see what I'm saying? Not just, um, it's, what, it's the difference that I say between an event and a principle. An event, you can go through a circumstance over here and learn, or, or there be a principle application, but you don't get the principle, and God gets you through the thing, and you don't remember the principle. You only had an event, so you have nothing to apply to a similar situation. The events are different, but the principle would still apply. I'm, I'm, am I explaining this? There is a difference between events and principle. And, and uh, it, it would be like, it would be like, um, you know, me and Deb out in traffic and she's driving. <clears throat> and I say, and when you get in this situation, you need to do so and so or whatever. And so she gets in that exact situation and she remembers and so she avoids that. But when I said it, I was saying a principle, not an event. So she gets in another one, but it's not the same intersection. It's not the same deal. It looks different. Everything feels different. The principle still would apply perfectly. What do I do now? And I'm not saying she did this. I'm just making, you know. What do I do now? You know, you say, well, you apply the principle <laughs> if you said that. Now, how did that go again? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? How did that go again? So you explain it again. Then you get in a whole nother traffic situation with a whole different thing, and you go, now what do I do here? Well, you do the same thing here as you did two months ago when we were in that one, and two weeks ago when we were in this one. Yeah, but, uh, I, you know, because you're just seeing events, so everything's confusing. But if you see the principle, you go, oh, okay, yeah. So, all uh, right. Nice, good teaching, great. Thank you, Brother Andy, for saying all that. It, even that, it's absolutely worthless unless the Lord shows you truly, deeply the difference between events and principles. The, it'll just be another event. And, and guess what? I bet I probably taught this kind of stuff before. <laughs> you know? And somebody goes, well, that's good. I don't have a good memory, so I, I don't, you know. <laughs> All right, let me try finishing this here. <clears throat> um, God has no delight in just taking us through testings, but it is the only way he can confirm his word or his promises to us. Because in some cases, these promises have been fulfilled in Christ and apply to us. But they're just scriptures until... They're valuable to you in life. And workable. And I, I mean, you know, why, you know, we could have called this place uh, uh, Holy Bible Institute of Theology. Yeah, of Revelation. We call it Accelerated Christian Training School. I get in more trouble with people who leave here mad because they didn't want the training. <laughs> but it was, it's a training school. You're supposed to be put through stuff where you learn to apply this stuff. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, the only ones left amen and are people who've gotten it except these two and they're learning it and they're getting it. So I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Everybody else is gone. <laughs> yes. Do you know people, um, sign up to be in the army or go out or whatever and they get really bad <laughs> they're Yeah. Well, that's the deal. I mean, one of the recent things said about us is that this person said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I know this isn't a direct quote or anything, but it was, as soon as we got off work, we had to immediately go to classes. And we had to go to class from 3 to 9 o'clock at night. And this was, day, you know, day after day. Yeah, and it's like, 
okay, now there were breaks in between. We all hung out and laughed and carried on, and we did, you know, went to the bathroom. And, but it sounds like soon as you got off work, you were forced, forced labor and stuff. And uh, it's just a yeah. Well, it's like those people who've never been to college. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like it's way harder. Yeah, good example. All right, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm sorry if I'm getting off on a lot of this stuff tonight, last two sessions. But you know what? There is stuff to be learned through this. I mean, hopefully we can learn some stuff. I mean, I would hope, you know. And I would hope that other students coming in behind me may watch some of these classes or they would be used for other Bible schools somewhere else or just people in other cities or countries listening to it would go, you know, that's good. I need to, you know, and they would learn instead of and maybe it would register so when you want to throw a fit you go oh yeah uh, i'm in training uh for the lord i'm in the lord's army you know <laughs> where's the yes sir <laughs> all right so um It is his only way to confirm his word or his promises to us. Every time he unveils a new promise, there is a stretching to make it real. You can expect it. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Immediately the devil takes him out in the wilderness and tests if he really knows he's the son of God. Okay? It's just the way God works. <laughs> um, it is not about having right doctrine, but knowing the Lord and how to relate to him. Now, you'll get right doctrine, so don't misunderstand me. But I'm just saying, many go to theological institutions to get right doctrine and not ever really get the Lord. Uh, we go back to Exodus 17. When the people of Israel had no water and Moses cried out to the Lord for help, Lord, what shall I do? This people is almost ready to stone me. <clears throat> uh, do you know what the Lord says to Moses? Moses... Moses, get up on that rock over there. But Lord, I will be a better, I'll be a bigger target for their stones. <laughs> you know, stand up on the rock in front of the people. And they're ready, it said they're about ready to stone him. You know, I mean, that, I'm sorry, maybe I see things different than some people. <laughs> you know, God's response is, you know, he says, they're about ready to stone me. He says, get up on this big rock so everybody can see you. And you'll make a much better target for him. You know, <laughs> just kind of going. <laughs> but Lord, uh, um, but this is the way that God demonstrates through a life. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel, my rod wherewith thou smoteth the river, Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock. And thou shalt smite the rock. <clears throat> this is the way that we can get water for others. But, it, you know, I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to get water for others without being a target. Just not. I mean, if you really care, you're asking for trouble. If you really, really, really want to help people, you're going to be a target. But it's the only way to get water from the rock for them. You know? So you do it because you don't have to have their approval. You have to have the Lord's approval. And you know, that you, you trust that he knows that you're with him in this endeavor. And you're not just doing something. <clears throat> um, God has a way of stretching us until we, come, we become fruitful and uh, can meet the need of others. Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. Um, I was jotting down, I think it's Psalm 27. I've got a verse here. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. And this is because you have 
set yourself upon a rock, which sounds real spiritual, but you know that you've also made yourself a target, but you're doing it for the Lord. That's why I quoted that. Um, um, and just that thing that we, we many times romanticize everything. You know, serving Jesus is just hard sometimes, okay? I know that new Christians have, and I, I, you know, I'm glad Nicole's not in here right now. I, you know, fresh, sweet, alive, and then you, all you do is talk about the cross. But it's better to prepare them, you know, it's better to prepare them than to walk into that like many Christians do, and they don't see the cross at all. It's just bad stuff, and they miss the Lord, and they miss everything that's really eternal in the situation. And then they just leave hurt and wounded, and my God, I mean, if we could stand in the gap for them, if we could be willing to get up on that rock for them, the ones that are, the ones that are saying, let's stone him, you know. Um, Yes. Man. Yeah. And you know, all these are right. Everything, you know, I mean, as much as I'm trying to say the right principles also, as you guys are, they're right. But you're never going to learn them until you get in the trial. You truly, you've only memorized them or at best, you know, at best memorized them and at worst heard them and let them pass by and then have to have them reset in the trial so that you can compare the two. And that gets, that gets rough too. I, it was interesting, the verses that I read there in Psalm 27, one of the, the next verse after what I just read about getting up on that rock, uh, he says, so when thou saidest, seek, when thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face will I seek. Um, there is in the process of all of this a heart for the Lord, not just for the people too. Now I've, do, I've told you the heart but there has to stay this heart for the Lord because the end goal is not just giving water to the people. The end goal is to seek the Lord so that you'll be changed into his same image. In the process of that, God feeds people, God heals people, God will do incredible things, honestly, in the process of that. But you're not going to have that heart for the people unless you're looking into his face and being changed in the same image from glory. You just won't. So there is a anchor to your being, and that anchor is um, when you said to me, Lord, seek you my face, my heart said back to you, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Um, I wrote one paragraph here, and I'm sure we got lots of time on the clock, but I may... Oh, yes. That's right. It's, that's, that's the way that it's there, and you know it's more than theory when the heart does say, That's right. Your faith, I will see. Amen. It's not even about, man, I've got to deal with these people. You know, right. I mean, Amen. That's so good. I, I love how she just put that because <clears throat> sometimes I say, you know, it's not about theology. And people who go, well, the all theology is, is, you know, Bible teaching or 
or do I say it's not about doctrine, and they'll just say it's about Bible teaching or whatever. But what Nisi was just saying, in case it didn't get recorded, and particularly this part that, that is, was impressive to me is, you can call it theology or doctrine or whatever, but as she was saying, it's just theory until it's worked in you. It's just theory. You say, no, it's not theory. It's reality. It's not your, re it's not your reality. It's not your reality. You're just believing stuff, you know. And I think it's interesting that, folks, many are the afflictions of the righteous because this is the way the Lord has to take you. You want the Lord. This is how you're going to get the Lord. If, you, if you'll recognize the path, then you'll be, it'll be a little easier. But if you don't, it's just like, you know, why is everything so hard? You know, well, because you, you're being conformed to the image of Christ. Yes. tell you another thing about that, that that I've seen is that there in Exodus 17 when Joshua is leading the fight down in the valley um, and then up on the hill you've got Moses and Aaron and her and they're holding up his arms we don't have an account of Joshua getting weary in the battle but we do of Moses holding up the banner of the whole thing and there's something that kicks in when you're in battle. You know, there's something that kicks in when you're in the fray, when you're, you know, in that sense. But when you're having to hold the banner of the whole thing, and I'm not just talking about me or the leader or whatever, although this is true. This is true of every leader. Um, the scriptures say there was weariness there. And there is. Because you don't have, I mean, even in the battle, you at least can fall back on adrenaline if necessary, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, just remember that because the Bible does say pray for your leaders. You know, I don't know how often you do that, but uh, I, I, the thought came to me tonight on the way to class. Um, you know, we went to this concert thing and uh, we had to walk you know, a certain amount of distance and walk back and and sometime we had to climb seats that were, you know, you weren't just and stuff like that and my hip and everything doesn't allow me to do a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I could feel the scar tissue just like feeling like it's going to break in a couple of points. You know, I was just worn out all day today. I mean, really, 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 really bad. And the thought came to me, um, I wonder how many of you prayed for our gathering and prayed that the Lord would really move and that he'd feed everybody and take care of everybody well I, I do want you to know and this is not this is just a fact <clears throat> this is like you know this is having to hold the banner of the thing I pray for you every time and I pray specifically that you would be able to hear what God wants to say not what I'm sharing necessarily and I do that because it, that's what it's all about. We got to get something from the Lord, and so I, I genuinely, I mean, I genuinely pray every time for, for you because I care. But if I really am doing that every time, that's going to make me a target. It just is, you know. And uh, I'm doing way better than I thought I would. So somebody prayed, or just the Lord, life of the Lord, or something. Somebody cares, or no, I don't mean care. We all care. I know we care, but I mean. I can feel something beyond me. Um, 
All right. Um, um, and just, just making sure that what Nisi said, and that is because this was a big part of what I was trying to share last class and this one. It must get out of the realm of theory. And the only way it can do that is to test it. And the only way it can be tested is to have circumstances going contrary to what the Lord just said. You know, again, thou art my son. You know, has anybody ever heard from the Lord in the word or just spoke something or you got a word and something and then everything went haywire right after that? <laughs> well, that's because he's, he wants to get that in you. You say, well, he's testing it. Well, what that means is he wants to confirm it in you. That's what it means. It doesn't mean, well, I'm testing you because I know you're going to fail. You're going to fail the test, you know. And, uh, you know, I have faith in the Lord that even though I fail a test, I won't fail the course. You know, I really believe that. I believe he's going to see me through and I'll make it through the course, but I have failed some tests. You, anybody ever in high school, college, fail a few tests, you know? I failed a lot <clears throat> and laughed. <laughs> But, but, uh, the, but pass the course. All right, we were talking about this thing, though. Let me just finish that with that out. That, that verse that followed all of this about standing on the rock and everything, the Lord said, and he's, this guy, this David guy is saying, when the Lord spoke to me and said, seek my face, that's the Lord initiating that. That's his desire. He's saying, because why seek my face? Because that's how you're going to be changed into my image, or that's how you're going to be confirmed into oneness. And being one with him, I'm telling you, I believe, and I'm, you know, I'm sure others are more wise than me, so what do I know, is, is one of the top things. Oneness is just it, because there you are one with Christ. You draw from all of his resources. Every hope is in that oneness. Every hope that you have is in that oneness. And so to, so the Lord says, seek my face. And here's where I'm getting that from. The scripture says, as we look into his face, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So that's where I'm getting that from. I'm not just randomly saying something there. <clears throat> so he says, when the Lord said to me, seek ye my face, my heart said, my heart said, Thy face, O Lord, I will seek. Um, you know, have you ever noticed couples that, <clears throat> that have been married for a long time? There are couples that have been married for a long time, and they sit across the table from each other day after day, and, look, and after 50 years, they look like one another. Have you ever seen that? I've seen that. I've seen that with, with people who weren't married and had dogs. And after, you know, a certain period of time, they, them and their dogs start looking alike, you know. <clears throat> and and uh, you know, you see you see that happen. Um, the scripture says, "As in water, face answer it to face." So the heart of man to man. That's Proverbs twenty-seven nineteen. When hearts are open and you begin to see their heart. The two of you begin to have the same image, the same look. After a while, looking into their heart is like looking into water because your, heart, your hearts are so alike in the image it bears. And then John says in 1 John uh, 3, 2, we should be like him. That's, that's only a promise or theory. We should be like him for we shall see him as he is. So it is a promise. But, it, but there's a requirement in that we should be like him for we shall see him as he is. Not for sure you will see him, but if you see him as he is, you will be like him. Okay. And uh, so I'll just close with this and just say, you know, my 40 years or whatever of serving the Lord and knowing the Lord, that's a pittance in light of the Ancient of Days. Him who was and is and is to come, it's just ridiculous. I mean, to think that you would know anything uh, in such a short drop in a bucket time is ridiculous. <clears throat> so what I try to do 
is I try to keep a certain portion of my heart in a place that says, I don't know you, Lord. Okay. And the early going, when somebody said, you don't know the Lord, you don't know him, you need to know him, that used to offend me. When I went to Berean, you know, and people would say, you, well, you just don't know the Lord. I'd go, I do too. I got saved. I mean, it, it really did. It offended me. It took me a while to get used to that because I felt like they were trying to rob me of what little Jesus I had. You know, it's like, leave that alone. <laughs> okay? But, after a certain period of time, I've been able to keep a certain portion open to say, I don't know the Lord. There is a vastness of him that I don't know. And, and that scripture says, for we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I think in certain areas I see him as he is, but I think that he's so much greater than what I see that I need to keep going. And not only keep going, I need to reserve that heart towards the one that speaks to me and says, seek ye my face. And, and I, need, I need my heart to respond, my heart to respond to that voice, that request. It's like a prayer request. Jesus having a prayer request. Seek ye my face. And my heart will respond and say, Thy face, O Lord, I will seek. Because in seeking the face, you are seeking to see him. His angle of asking you to seek his face is in seeking his face, you will be one with him, more one, more identified with him. Do you understand? In truth, you can't get any more one. The identification in that oneness will be stronger, and he will love it. Okay? So, you know, our heart is pure. We just want you. His heart is, well, I just want you. <laughs> Seek you, my face. Can you see how beautiful that dovetails together? What did that scripture say? As in water face answers the face. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your son and, and his wooing, his calling, his care, his love, his embrace, his reach. He's even reaching with his voice, reaching to our hearts, longing for us to embrace that which is already true. But if we do embrace it, we will have seen your face and what is already true will be stronger, solidified in us, confirmed in us, whatever words we've used tonight. It will be moved out of theory into, Lord, not theology or doctrine, but reality. Reality of identification into oneness. Reality of being and flowing as one with you. And Lord, when it's all said and done, Nobody can truly question oneness with you. Nobody, they can talk about it, they can, but if we are confirmed in it, they can talk all they want. So Lord, help us, help us to see in spirit and help that reality be so strong that it calms the emotions, it clears the mind, it fills the face with shining, Lord, like you said in Psalms, like oil on the face that causes the face to shine. And Lord, we ask this because we want you. We want to know you. And we ask this so that your heart will be satisfied in our being made and confirmed more in that oneness. In Jesus' name, amen.